Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Disc Brakes Lecture. We're going to talk all that is disc brakes today, rotors, pads, all that fun stuff. We're going to talk service. We're going to talk uh, caliper rebuilds, all that fun stuff. And we are going to take a full week's lecture and we are going to shove it all into a few videos. You'll have to bear with me. Um, I don't do a whole lot of video editing on my spare time. So instead, I'm just going to record 15 minute clips. That way, if I screw up, I only have to re record 15 minutes worth of something rather than an hour worth of something um, or take hours to edit it out. So just bear with me. I'll do a series of uh, videos. So it makes it uh, easier for, for me to record. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do, I'm recording this actually through Zoom because Zoom allows me to screen share uh, using PowerPoint. So I can actually pop up the PowerPoint hopefully here in a few seconds um, and walk you guys through it. And uh, as I need to, I'll go ahead and stop the screen share, draw something on the whiteboard as needed uh, to further explain something and then pop right back up on PowerPoint. So you don't have to have two separate screens open while you're watching the lecture videos. So let's go ahead and try this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share here. Um, you guys should be able to see what I'm seeing here. There should be an itty bitty screen up in your top right hand corner. And here is your disc brakes lecture. Um, or the PowerPoint presentation. So let's go ahead and get into it. I'm not going to get into the objectives of things, uh, but let's just get started with some basic stuff. We've kind of already talked about disc breaks in general at the beginning of the semester. We talked about some of the components involved. You guys are able to do some basic inspections so far. The lab that would be correlated with this section is going to be a really thick lab packet and you guys are going to take apart disc brake assemblies, you're going to inspect every bit of them, uh, you are going to put them back together properly. I know a lot of you guys have already done breaks at home. There are some things that you might be doing correctly, some things that you may not be doing correctly and I'm going to go ahead and hopefully rectify that. When we come back into our lab, we are going to uh, do all of this hands-on. Um, so we're just sort of knocking this stuff out as we go along. Um, with that being said, we should have talked about this last week um, while I was gone, actually the previous week while I was gone in Tennessee, but we didn't have a sub. So we're kind of technically a couple weeks behind. I have no uh, thought in my mind that we can't catch up especially this online format may actually be beneficial to us to, to move a little bit quicker through the lecture portion. Um, so that should be pretty cool. So uh, we'll get caught up in no time next week. We'll do drum breaks and then we'll get caught up in our hydraulic systems and brake bleeding and all that cool stuff. And then when we come back for lab um, after April 30th as of uh, the most recent announcement, then uh, we will go ahead and do all of the fun stuff. So back to disc brakes. We already know that there is rotors. We already know that there are calipers that squeeze the rotor as it is spinning so we can stop the vehicle. We know about the brake pads inside of the rotor, um, as you can see here in the picture. Uh, you guys have already done a basic inspection on this, so I don't want to beat that any further. I do want to talk about some advantages and disadvantages though. So reason why we use disc brakes isn't because they necessarily do a better job at stopping. And we've talked about this already. Disc brakes actually are not as good at stopping uh, as say something like a duo servo drum brake. So you're like, whoa, that's not at all what uh, before this class we knew, right? We thought for sure disc brakes are the jam, which is why everybody does disc brake conversions and uh, why all new vehicle or remotely new vehicles uh, are using disc brakes in the front. The reason why we're using them is because they are resistant to fade. They self-adjust. We have a better consistency, so they don't create drivability problems as far as pulling. Sometimes drum brakes can be a little bit moody in that way, and we'll talk about why when we get in there next week. Um, 
but there are some advantages to disc brakes. So they do have a strong resistance to fade. Um, last time we were in class, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when we had uh, previous study guides that talked about uh, brake fade. Uh, I believe even in lecture, we talked about brake fade. So lining fade, if you remember, was our brake lining, the brake pads or shoes themselves, uh, the material getting too hot and it loses its coefficient of friction. That's our lining fade, right? And if you remember correctly, our mechanical fade, while the uh, drum brakes, again, can only happen in drum brakes, when drum brakes get so hot, so remember metal is a little bit malleable and it expands when it gets hot. So the shoes go to push out against the drum brake, but the drum has expanded. And so the shoes have to travel further out, uh, which creates a fade for the driver. Um, an extremely low brake pedal and such. That is our mechanical fade. Well, we can't have that problem if we don't have a drum, right? If the rotor expands, it's actually going to get closer to the pads and you'd actually get lockup. So that wouldn't necessarily, that'd be the opposite of fade. Back to lining fade, because I kind of breezed through that for a moment. So we know that it's because the pads or shoes get too hot, right? Well, the cool part about disc brakes is that we have constant airflow around, right? lots of uh, space for cooling, lots of uh, air traveling through. So the pads uh, are not gonna get near as hot as quickly as uh, say compared to shoes. So we get a lot less lining fade than we do with drum brakes and shoes. Uh, uh, back to mechanical fade, we can't even have that because we don't have a drum to expand instead we use a rotor. So we can't even possibly get mechanical fade. Lining fade, we still can. It's just not as common on a disc brake assembly because of the cooling capabilities. Water fade, it can also happen in disc brakes, but it's less likely. And the reason why is because disc brake assemblies are an open assembly, meaning that if I get water in, in my assembly, it's got space to let go of it and, and uh, displace it. In a drum brake, it is harder for water to get in, but once the water has gotten in, it's hard to let it loose. And so that becomes an issue. So that's the advantage of disc brakes when it comes to water fade. Gas fade, um, again, it's an airflow issue. So if you remember gas fade correctly, gas fade happened when the glue that is holding our lining to its backing plate, so whether it be a shoe on uh, the backing plate for, for the shoe in a drum assembly, or the brake pad against the brake pad backing plate. If it is a bonded type of lining, that glue, not super common nowadays, but back in the day, the type of glue we use, when it got past a particular temperature, it would release a gas that would create a barrier in between our rotor and our pad or our drum and our shoe. And so we would lose that coefficient of friction. Well, we don't use that type of material anymore because of that problem. So uh, we don't have that problem in general. But if we did, disc brakes would be better at getting rid of that. And that's because of airflow through the assembly. As to our drum brakes, everything's sort of enclosed. So we don't get that same airflow that we do with a disc brake assembly. So again, disc brakes sort of resist, uh, they're not immune to it, but they do resist gas feed a lot better than drum brakes do. Another cool part about disc brakes is that they are self-adjusting. You never have to go and adjust them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about how they do that using a square cut seal in a few slides here, but they don't require any adjustment from a technician standpoint. It's self-adjusting up until you get new pads and you uh, initially push the caliper back in, a uh, piston back in. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but they're self-adjusting. Uh, pulling. So drum brakes, especially the duo servo kind, if you've read about them, uh, they have an issue with pulling. Um, sorry if you hear any noise in the background. <laughs> Drum brakes can be a little bit moody in that sense um, because of a uh, duo servo. Again, I know we haven't talked about it yet, but if you write about it, uh, or a self-energizing action, you can get brake lockup um, on accident, which is part of what makes our disc brakes uh, advantageous. So we don't have this 
We don't have the advantage of a self uh, actuating brake. However, because of that self actuation, we don't have lockup, accidental lockup. So we have less pulling when it comes to disc brakes. Um, that will make a lot more sense when I get into the duo servo drum brakes next week. Uh, but you can just know that disc brakes don't have issues with pulling when they're working normally, uh, which is really nice. So they're very consistent. So if we continue through another advantage of disc brakes is that we have something called uh, swept area. We have it on all brakes, but disc brakes happen to have more swept area than drum brakes do. So what the hell is swept area anyways? Swept area is gonna be any, uh, anywhere where the friction surface, and when I say friction surface, where my rotor touches the pad, so friction surface is going to be my rotor. The lining surface is going to be my pad, right? On a drum, uh, the friction surface would be my drum, and the lining surface would be my shoe. Right now, we're talking about disc brakes, though. So the swept area is the area in which uh, my, sh my, my pad touches the rotor. There is actually more surface area that touches the pad than say on a drum brake where the shoe touches the drum. So if you look down in the picture on the bottom right in the PowerPoint presentation, all that red, uh, yellowish, orangey area, that is where our swept area is. Well, on a rotor, you'll notice that there's actually two sides. Uh, one side a pad touches and on the other side, another pad touches. So we, if we calculate the amount of square inches that that pad could possibly touch the rotor and compare it to in a drum where the shoe could possibly touch the drum, there's actually more area that gets touched. Here's why this is important. That swept area, when the pad is not touching the rotor in that swept area, it allows for cooling. Well, if I have more of that swept area, when the pad is not touching it, so as I press down on my brakes, where my pad touches the rotor, anywhere where the pad is, it can touch the rotor, but is not touching the rotor, if that makes sense. In fact, actually, let me go ahead, I'm gonna stop the screen share, and I'm gonna take us to the whiteboard here for a moment because I want to further explain this. This is a little bit tough to explain, especially through a video like this. So if I'm looking at my brake rotor, right? So here's where the touch, the flange right goes on the hub assembly, and here is the rotor assembly, right? Not a perfect circle, but you know, we'll deal with it. If this is the area in which my pad touches, we'll just look at one side for right now. That means, that this whole area that I am squiggling it in here, this is what we call sweat area. And that sweat area, while the pad is not touching this whole area, it's cooling. And I even have the other side of the rotor that's doing the same thing. The problem with a drum is that it's inside of my drum, do the same thing, no planch here. Um, I, I'm not good at doing 3D drawings, uh, but I do have two shoes. And those shoes are actually really long, right? And I've got two of them touching that same friction surface, if that makes any sense. So right now, if we're to look at this inside of my drum, that swept area that's not being touched is a whole lot less than say on a rotor and it doesn't have two sides like a rotor does. So if cooling capability is not near as good as a rotor. Rotor has more swept area, therefore better cooling capability, again, better resistance to fade. So if that, hopefully that makes sense. If not, shoot me a question. Um, in the messaging. So I'm gonna go back to screen sharing. That is our swept area and that's why rotors are better cooling because they have more swept area than the drums do. Let's go back to screen share. 
and hopefully I can make this happen seamlessly and it takes us right, oh, no, here we go, cool. And we'll go back to this. So that's uh, exactly what I was explaining. Here we go. Oh, I didn't have a picture there. All right, disc breaks do have disadvantages though. So as I mentioned, um, there's something called a servo action or self-energizing action in disc brakes don't have it. In fact, I'll, I'll probably pause the screen sharing here in a moment just to explain that servo action um, because if you don't know what that is, you're like, well, then what's, what's the big deal? Um, so I'll, I'll explain that here in a moment, but I do want to get into noise. So disc brakes are actually more noisy than drum brakes. And the reason for that is, sorry about that, there's a, got a couple neighbors that do uh, stunts on their Harleys back and forth, which is pretty awesome, but uh, not really making videos because it's kind of loud. So, uh, sorry, back to noise. Disc brakes are open, which is why they're better for cooling why they're better at resisting water fade and gas fade and all that stuff, right? Because they're nice and open. Well, there's a disadvantage to that. Because they're open, they also have an issue with you hearing everything that's going on. So they're a lot noisy um, or a lot more prone to noise that the driver can hear, especially with certain types of brake pads. Semi-metallics happen to be a pretty noisy pad. Um, just under normal operation, but we'll get into that later. And then also disc brakes, if we're going to utilize the caliper for a parking brake, the parking brake mechanism is a bit more complicated. As to where a drum brake, we're pretty much using the drum brake like a drum brake. Uh, disc brakes, uh, you can see in the picture here down below, um, there's actually a, a whole mechanism, a separate mechanism inside that has to be there if we're gonna use the caliper as a parking brake. We'll get into that when we get into parking brakes. Hopefully we'll be back in the school by then. Um, but that will be another PowerPoint presentation, another lecture. Um, but it is a bit more complicated, which is why if you've ever done a set of rear brakes, you have to screw the rear caliper piston back in, kind of like a bolt. That's why. It's because of that parking brake uh, mechanism. So. There's sort of a little disadvantage there. There's more parts involved, more things to break. Um, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Let's go ahead and return, <coughs> excuse me, back to the servo action. So I'm gonna sort of stop sharing again so we can go back here. And I'm gonna erase what I have here. Um, so if we're looking at a drum brake, and I'm going to have a video in this next week for your, um, drum brake section. So if you don't quite understand this, not a huge deal. I'm going to add as many visuals as possible in videos. So if we're looking at Again, the center part where it's, our drum sort of slides on to our hub assembly. I know this looks a lot like a rotor, but just try to bear with me here. This is the inside of the drum. If it makes me feel better, I'll draw a little outside portion. Uh, right, so this is our drum. And these red uh, leaves, I'm not gonna draw the wheel cylinder up at the top but these are our shoes. And our shoes, if you guys hadn't noticed, so there is some material on those shoes. And um, what's holding those shoes in place, and when you go to apply those shoes, what keeps them from sort of flying off, is going to be this sort of webbing, right? And that webbing, is gonna have a little spring uh, holding them that's gonna hold the shoes in place, right? Well, there are two different types of drums or drum assemblies. One is gonna be called a duo servo. The other is gonna be called leading trailing. The kind I'm drawing right now is gonna be called a duo servo. 
And what that means is it has no anchor. Um, so what's gonna happen is as my shoes engage, so obviously our drum is moving as the vehicle is moving. So if we're going forward, my drum is spinning, right? And we want to stop the vehicle. So that means I need to stop the drum to stop the wheel, right? How do we do that? Well, I step on the brake pedal. I engage my master cylinder build pressure in the hydraulic system, which is going to build pressure in the wheel assembly, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the wheel cylinder up here, which is going to push my shoes out up against the drum, right? Well, the self-energizing action actually allows my shoes to pivot just a hair, not a ton, but it allows them to pivot and here's why. It, it, it's an excellent advantage and disadvantage all at the same time. So if my drum is rotating like this, if I engage my shoes and I allow them to pivot, this shoe is going to engage, and we'll talk about primary and secondary shoes. This is gonna be our primary. Um, but our, our primary shoe is going to engage first and our secondary shoe is actually going to move up and wedge itself up against the drum just because of that pivot action. Well, that's really nice because that pivot action wedges my secondary shoe up against the drum, kind of forcing it to stop. So it stops so much better than disc brakes. The problem with that is it also sometimes stops too good and it engages lockup when we don't necessarily want it and that's where the pulling can come from. So if you've ever driven a vehicle with all four drums, you know that every time you brake, you get something a little bit different out of it, especially if the brakes haven't been serviced uh, for a while um, and, and you have any type of contamination or anything like that. And I actually drew this sort of backwards. Your primary shoe is a little bit smaller, while your secondary shoe is usually a little bit longer. We'll talk about that next week though. Um, but that is your servo action. So I'm gonna go back to, uh, so that's the problem with disc brakes. They don't have servo action, but that's also an advantage. Because they don't have servo action, also keeps them from locking up when you don't necessarily want them to. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to screen sharing. Um, and I actually, sorry, I'm a little bit of an issue here. I'm gonna go ahead and actually share. Okay, here we go. And we're back. Okay, cool. So, <coughs> excuse me, moving along here. That is our disc brake disadvantage. Um, I want to talk a little bit about rotors before I stop the video and start another one, just in case uh, anything gets screwed up. So as far as rotors are concerned, if you look in the slide, We've got a bunch of different types of rotors. We've got solid versus ventilated, which you actually have in the picture there. Um, rotors that have sort of that split down the center and have cooling fins, those are ventilated. If you look at the bottom picture at a solid rotor, it is simply a solid disc. Uh, as you can imagine, which rotors are going to need ventilation, better cooling, which ones are gonna build up heat faster? You probably guessed right, your front brakes, right? Because if you remember in the last time that we were actually in a lecture, we talked about most of our braking is done up front and specifically around 70 to 80% of our braking is gonna be done up front while the rest is done in the rear. So our rear doesn't need near as much cooling as our front does. So a lot of times you will notice that front brakes are ventilated while the rear brakes are solid because they don't necessarily need to be. Now, not all rear brakes are gonna be solid, Sometimes you'll come across ones that are ventilated, but if you ever come across solid rotors, it's probably gonna be a rear brake. I, I've never personally seen solid front rotors on an actual automotive application. Um, not saying that they don't exist, but I'm saying that they're gonna be extremely rare if they do. Um, then we've got fixed versus floating. We've got cross-drilled versus slotted. And I know we've already talked about that in class, but I'll get in, into it a little bit more here. Um, I got some good pictures here. So ventilated rotors, there are different types of ventilated rotors. 
Uh, we've got ones that are directional, ones that are non-directional. Um, if you've ever seen those sort of kangaroo paw, crazy looking ones, um, it has to do with surface area. Uh, that does, they, can, they actually are beneficial um, because it allows for better heat dissipation. Um, because of the surface area involved on your kangaroo paw design. Um, but the, the uh, vein design that you see on the left in the picture, um, the cutaway, so we've got the kangaroo paw on this is the top picture. I'm sorry, I can't really point to it because um, it's not behind me like in class. But uh, if we're looking at the kangaroo paw design, on the left is the vein design. That one is non-directional, but if you look at the bottom picture, there are uh, two vein designs. One is directional, one is non-directional or straight veins. If it's a straight vein design, you can put it on the right or left, doesn't matter, it's not directional. But if it's not a straight design or a straight vein design, you need to make sure that you pay attention to the direction of those veins. Because if you don't, you could end up causing the heat to sort of hold in place rather than let out uh, and dissipate. So um, I gave you guys a little picture down there to sort of help guide you if you're not sure which direction the veins go, because I know not everyone's a cutaway. And actually, any rotor you're gonna put on shouldn't be a cutaway. Uh, what you can do, a nice little trick, is take a screwdriver and sort of shove it down in the veins, and it should show you the angle of the veins. If not, you can always pay attention to your part numbers, and the part numbers will generally be different from right to left. Um, but if you're not sure, go ahead and use a screwdriver or a skinny extension or a pen or whatever. Stick it in the veins and see if it is straight uh, or if it's directional in one way or the other. Now, it's kind of like you, some people think that they're actually supposed to go in the opposite direction um, to, to sort of gather air in. We don't want gather to gather air in. We want to let air out. Um, if we gather air in, we get stagnant air that's hot and will overheat the rotors and what will happen is they'll get warped prematurely and stuff like that. So rather than that happen, just make sure that you put them in the correct direction, like in the picture I have there for you. Um, fixed versus floating rotors. So some of you guys found this out in lab, but the fixed rotor design actually, um, is not as easy to take off as a floating rotor. Fixed rotors have the wheel hub assembly inside, meaning the wheel bearing as well. Um, if you look in the left picture there, uh, where the technician is pulling the rotor off, that sort of skinny piece that's sticking off of the knuckle, that's called a spindle. If a vehicle has a fixed rotor design, it will have spindles. If, it, if, if it's a floating rotor, it will not have spindles. The spindle is that uh, finger sticking off uh, uh, of the knuckle, the steering knuckle itself, um, the one with all the grease on it. And you can see on the right picture, uh, the technician is pulling some of the bearing material out of the front portion of, of the rotor. I'm going to show you guys how to service taper roller wheel bearings when we get back into lab. Um, and we'll get a much better, closer look at the fixed rotor design. The hard part about fixed rotors um, is just they're not as quick to service as, say, floating rotors. Um, but we'll talk more about that when we get into servicing wheel bearings and stuff like that. Floating rotors are really basic and what, uh, is what a lot of you guys know. So when are you ever going to see fixed rotors? Um, most of the time they're going to be on trucks. You're not really, unless it's an old car, it's like 70s or something like that. For the most part, your fixed rotors are going to be not even on all trucks, just on some trucks. The Chevy S10s that we have back at school, those are going to be fixed rotors up in the front. Um, but some Silverados are floating in the front, so it really just depends um, on the design. So if you look here uh, on the left, uh, there is actually some spacing around the hub assembly, um, and you can clearly see that as if I was to take that caliper frame off, I could just pull the rotor off all by itself, right? Um, which is what you guys have seen uh, and, and what, what's normal to you. On the right, that's what it looks like when I pull the rotor off. That's our hub assembly with the bearing. It is separate from the rotor, um, not together. So 
uh, that that's what your floating design looks like. If you're dealing with a floating design, a lot of times your rotor will have screws, especially Honda's, but other companies as well, they will have little screws you can see in the picture down below that are holding them in place. Those screws are not the only thing that's holding the rotor in place, which is why not all companies use them. Some companies use clips, some companies don't use anything at all to hold the rotor on. If those two screws were the only thing holding the rotor on, you'd be in trouble. Uh, when the wheel is on and your lug nuts are torqued properly, that is holding the rotor on in place as well. Um, but those screws are handy uh, for when you're working on the rotor without the wheel assembly on. So I suggest always replacing them back when you are taking things apart. But let's say you lost a screw, it's no big deal. Um, even if you lost both the screws. However, it does make working on the brake assembly a little bit tougher or servicing it. So I always suggest putting them back in. But here's the deal. They do get pretty snug, really easy. Um, and this has to do with the way that the wheel rotates and, and a couple of things too. People think that they're like lug nuts and they need to be tightened really, really tough back in. They get rusted in place a lot. So they can be really bare to take off. Here is something that's gonna save you a huge amount of time. And I sh hopefully, I think I already showed you guys back in class, but in the picture here, the technician is about to use an impact screwdriver. An impact screwdriver has a spring-loaded uh, assembly inside, so you can actually push the screwdriver's portion sort of in and out of the screwdriver assembly and it's rotational. So what you're gonna need is an impact screwdriver with the correct bit so it fits in the screw properly. If it's really loose, you're gonna strip it. You're gonna destroy your bit and you're gonna strip it. So make sure it fits nice and snug. Um, you're going to put the screwdriver into the screw. You're going to hammer the screw uh, driver as you're already loading it in the direction that you wanna go, obviously lefty, loosey. So you're gonna put the screwdriver in place. You're going to push it up against the screw, load it to the left, and then you're gonna hammer it. What it's gonna do is it's actually going to, the hammer is gonna push the screw in, so you are less likely to strip it. But as you impact that screwdriver, it's actually gonna to turn to the left to help you or assist you take those screws off. So those are really, really nice I'll do a quick demo when we get back into class. Um, it, will, it will be a lifesaver as a technician. Also, another tech tip I'm just gonna add on to here is use PB Blaster on those, especially if you know that they've probably never been removed before or that it's been a long time, maybe they're rusted or they look like they haven't been removed in a long time. Make sure you use some good old PB Blaster on that or some sort of penetrant let it sit for a few minutes and then hit it with the impact screwdriver and most of the time they'll come out like butter. Um, sometimes not, but uh, that's really the best you can do to make your life easier. Uh, last thing about rotors is cross drilled versus slotted and we've talked about this before, but I'm just going to get in a little bit more detail here uh, to further explain. So We've talked about the difference between cross-drilled and slotted, right? If you look in the top pictures, those are your cross-drilled rotors with the holes that are drilled through them, hence cross-drilling. The slotted rotors have slots cut out into them, like in the bottom picture. Slotting can be in uh, straight lines, but if you look in the bottom right picture, it's sort of in these curved lines. It doesn't really matter um, what all of these are four is really similar. Most of the time it's to prevent gas and water fade, but we've already spoke before, gas fade's not really a thing anymore. The glue that we use to mold our pads against their backing plate, they don't have that same glue that releases a gas. And so that's something that we wanna think about they do look really cool though, so there's that. Uh, they do help resist against water fade though, um, but so does slotting. So cross drilling has some disadvantages though. Um, here's the thing, and, and I really wanna get into this here uh, because I'm gonna stop share here and I'm gonna go back 
to our full screen. Okay, so I'm going to erase what I have up here and I want to get a little bit into the myths around cross drilling. So, so many companies have the argument that it's, it's for cooling, it's, it's better cooling. There's a little bit of an argument to it, but let me tell you why it's kind of a myth that's a little bit busted. So first things first, let me make the argument that most of the companies do, that it's, uh, it's for cooling. So the lower level argument is that, oh, it allows air to go through the rotor. There's more to that argument though. So if we're looking at a side view, so if we're looking at the front view of our rotor, right? There's our flange again. Um, and I've got these holes for cooling. It's a horrible picture, I know, but bear with me. I think I'm not an art teacher, right? Um, those holes would theoretically allow airflow. Here's a better argument why they would be better for cooling, and then I'll debunk it. If we're looking at a side view of the rotor, the argument could be made that, uh, remember I told you that the holes just don't go straight through like that. They're actually chamfered, so I'm gonna go ahead and fix that here. The argument here is that, well, now there's more surface area for air to travel through, therefore releasing heat through all of this extra surface area through each one of these holes. There's tunnels, and those tunnels have more surface area for cooling. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Sure. So it must be better for cooling. Here's the issue. They're not wrong if they explain it that way but it's not totally right. So yes, there is more surface area in that respect. Here's the problem. So we're dealing with two separate things. We have surface area, the area of the rotor that actually touches air, right? The argument could also be made that there is less mass so surface area is gonna be the area that touches air, but the problem is, is we still need to think about heat dissipation. Think about that word, dissipate, right? So if we're thinking of dissipation, that's area, uh, the, the meat of the rotor that the heat is able to travel through. Well, if I've got a bunch of holes cut out in my rotor, I have less mass that's where the real problem lies. So even though I may have more surface area touching air, because I have less mass, I create uh, worse, I don't want to say worse, um, but it's not, the cooling advantage is actually lost because of the, it, it's outweighed by the disadvantage of less mass. So why does anybody still have these cross drilling? It looks really cool. Um, I mean, you still prevent water fade, but here, here's another reason to, um, is we get cracking. So they create stress points, these holes in the rotor, they create stress points that will allow for cracking. So let me go back to our screen share here, and we should see in our picture, right here in this picture right here you can see that they create stress points that allow for cracking and uh, a while back i talked about heat checking those tiny little cracks these are really prone to heat checking and they're really prone to cracking let's go to slotted so slotted prevents the same gas fade prevents the same water fade it actually helps in a couple of other areas too so we don't have any cracking we didn't take out as much mass, near as much mass as the cross drilling, so we don't have that problem. The slots in the rotors actually, as they sweep past the pads, clear the pad of any debris. If you've got any rocks or, or any crap inside the pads, guess what? 
clean slate every single time those slots swing by and it allows the pad uh, to grip a little bit better in that sense as well. Here's the one disadvantage of slotting. Because it does have that action where it sort of wipes the pad clean every single time it sweeps by, you do get a little bit of premature pad wear, uh, but that's not near as bad as having to replace your rotors every single time. And as I mentioned before, both of these are machinable. Uh, the cross drilling, as I mentioned before, you just need to make sure that when you're done machining it, you put the chamfer back in on the cross drilled. On slotting, you just need to really make sure that your bit on your lathe is really sharp. Um, if you got a dull bit, it, it, you could run into some issues, but we'll get into that when we get back into the lab. Um, but that's your cross drilled versus slotted. And that's sort of that argument of just, is it better for cooling, is it not? There's one more thing I wanna talk about, and then I'm just like going on and on here about the cross drilling. But uh, I was able to visit the Porsche PTAP training center and talk to one of their instructors, and I had to ask them, look, Porsche still continues to use this cross drilling, why? Uh, they're still under the uh, belief that it is better for cooling. And I'm not saying that Porsche is wrong. Here is the difference between Porsche and many other companies though. Porsche specifically has ducts that will take air coming underneath the vehicle and it will put it straight through the rotor. So uh, if you look at many Porsche designs, uh, behind the wheel assembly, you will notice that there is venting that is meant to push air out through the rotor. No other company is really, I mean, I don't want to say no other company, your average, your Honda, Toyota, Chevy, they're not doing that. Most of your vehicle manufacturers aren't venting, um, and when I say venting, they're, they're not ducting air specifically to go through the rotors. And so Porsche does have a little bit more of an advantage for cooling because they specifically have ducting for, for that in order to help some of the airflow through your cross drill. Um, but so, so that was their argument on that, but I'm sticking to my guns in that uh, slotting is definitely a whole lot better than cross drilling. So um, let's go ahead and we're gonna stop the video at this point in time, just in case, uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and make another video to continue the presentation. So um, I'll see you in the next video.